I heard an old story. Thank you for tuning in to the television ministry of Clay's Mill Baptist Church. Join us as we share our passion for soul winning, spiritual growth, and revival in our state and nation. And now, Pastor Jeff Fugit. Well, good evening and welcome to the program tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are now at the beginning of April. Uh, this past week I was out of town and not able to record a television program. So what we did, uh, I am going to give you the Wednesday night Bible study, I believe, that is so very important and helpful. It will be a blessing in your life. So here's that Bible study. And if you would love to, uh, we'd love to have you come. And if you would enjoy studying the Bible, you'll enjoy being with us on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, 1220 Brandon Road. Here's that Bible study I believe will be a blessing to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. That temperate word is a key word, is temperate in all things. I want you to notice something here, a goal, a purpose in your life affects every part of your life. Did you see that? Temperate in all things. Didn't say just temperate in reaching the goal, but temperate in all things. Then the Bible says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so find I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. That is character. That is character. It's another key word for the lesson tonight. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway, or that word castaway uh, also means disqualified. He said, I don't want to be disqualified because he is using for an example here, a race. You may be seated and get your lesson, if you will. The passage is very uh, easy to understand and it is illustrated very well. Uh, five foundational statements. Number one, Paul compares the Christian life to a race and then he also gives an indication to a fight and uh, uses a similarity. The Christian life is like getting in a race. And when you get in a race, you sign up to run in a race, uh, you understand there's going to be competition, you understand there's going to be difficulty, and so you prepare to run in a race. There ought to be goals in your life that's consuming your thinking, that's controlling your behavior. We often say of children, one way to keep them out of trouble is keep them busy. Well, what's true for the children is also true for you and I as adults. We need to be busy uh, in the will of God. So Paul compares the Christian life to a race. Second of all, Paul contrasts. He shows what's alike and he shows what's different. And the difference is the runners of a race run to win a corruptible crown. Just a trophy that will collect dust in these days. It was a wreath uh, made out of leaves that would soon uh, just be gone. It would just fade away and, and and, uh, it would just be gone. But he said, we don't run for a corruptible crown. We run for one that is incorruptible. And we're going to receive rewards when we get to heaven and crowns when we get to heaven. And we want to do so. He said, my reward is with me. Uh, we want to do that because we want to be able to lay crowns at the feet of Jesus. So he contrasts the Christian life. Number three, Paul points out that there is a challenge. Not only a comparison, a contrast, there is a challenge. Or there is difficulty. There are obstacles in running a race. Setting a goal is not an easy task, but it has a most positive effect, especially in the will of God, and it we need to understand it is a challenge. It is a challenge. Just because you've tried and failed before doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. In fact, I'd rather try and fail at a hundred things and fail by never trying at all. If you've tried to read the Bible through and you've only read 20 books of the 66, you've read 20 more than those that never even tried to read the Bible through. So, so you're never a failure by trying. A just man falleth seven times and riseth again. So we have the word challenge. Number four, he tells us that there is a prize and it's worth running for. There is a prize and it's worth running for. If God wants me to run, that's motivation enough for me to run. 
If he wants me to serve, then I want to serve. If he wants me to run, if he wants me to fight, if he wants me to be in the race, that's motivation enough whether I receive a prize or not. He wants you, he wants me to be in his will. Number five, we are not observers. We're not observers. Those are Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, God could arrange that and make us observers. But we're not observers, we're participants. That's the word to write down. We're to be participating in the race. We're to be participating in the race. I told you this last week, just outside of the city of Corinth on the Ismian Plain, uh, the Greek games were held and they were very famous and folks uh, looked uh, to, uh, forward to them and crowds gathered to watch them. And that was the image that Paul sets forth, not only for the church at Corinth, uh, but is pre uh, preserved in the word of God for us today. Now notice this statement, and I've made this bold because it's important. Paul does more than encourage the Christian to run. He does more than just give a casual encouragement. Paul urges. Paul challenges. Paul prods. He makes them uncomfortable if they do nothing. My responsibility as a pastor is not to satisfy us where we are, to help us to grow in grace. My job is to prod. My job is to push. My job is to get the Christian to run and let's run together. And I'm honored to run with you. I'm thankful that God's allowed us to win a lot of races. And I'm, I'm glad that God's allowed us to accomplish a lot of things. Hey, but let's keep on running. Let's keep on running. Let's run till Jesus comes. Let's just keep on running. I was talking to a group of preachers yesterday uh, down in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And uh, they said, we, we appreciate the fact, I don't know if they were saying I was old or what, uh, but they said, uh, we appreciate the fact you're still excited about serving God. I said, well, what else would you be? They said, but all these years you've been excited about serving God, you're still excited. I am still excited. I am, and I'm looking forward to what God wants to do. I'm thankful for what God has done, but let's not stop and just look at all of that. Let's see what God wants to do and press on and keep on running. Now, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is for us to participate in. And there are three things that we benefit from when we get into the race and run. When we set spiritual goals in our life, when we set goals for our family, goals for our church, first of all, it increases our character. It increases our character, and we need that. Uh, we need to increase our character. Second of all, it increases our temperance. It increases our temperance. It helps us to control our life in every area. Oh, please listen to me tonight. I'm just going to teach 35 minutes, and this is, this is helpful stuff. Number three, it, it increases our strength. It increases our strength. Now, we need to have goals. You say, preacher, what goals do I need to have in life? I can give you some ideas and some suggestions, but I'd like for every person to say, Lord, what do you want me to do at my age, at my stage in life, at my experience in life, at my opportunities in life? What do you want me to do? What goals do you want me to set in life? I want you to think about it. What about personally? What goals do you need to set in your personal life? I think of four areas of life, spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental. I want to challenge myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. What about your marriage? What goal can you set in your marriage? What do you need to work on in your marriage? What is it that you could make better in your marriage? There's several relationships in marriage that I talk about in teaching and premarital counseling. For example, uh, there's a relationship of communication. Maybe you could learn to communicate better or set a goal, learning to communicate better. Communication is not just talking. Communication is listening. What about, what about loving or expressing your affection? Maybe setting a goal and expressing your affection. And there's several goals and things we could talk about as far as our marriage is concerned. Right now, the next goal for our church is a big day, April 16. Now, why would we want to have that many people come to church? Because we want everybody to hear the gospel that we can. Everybody that's saved and not baptized, we want them to get baptized. Everybody that's saved and baptized, we want them serving God. We want them walking with God. We need prayer warriors in our nation today. Our nation, our nation is crumbling before our eyes. And there is no hope in Washington. And you know that's true. And there's not much hope talked 
talked about on radio and television. The talking heads are just blaming this person and that person. And there's only one answer. And you know what that is? And that's God. And you and I, God's people, are the only ones that can get a hold of God and make a difference. Goals in our life personally, goals in our life in our marriage, goals in our life in our church. Why would we want to have that many people? We want to reach folks with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's go on. Uh, Notice it increases our character. Number one, it increases our character. Character is parenting ourselves. That's an interesting statement. I first heard Dennis Corll make that statement nearly 30 years ago. He said, growing up, your parents, they say it's time to get up. They say it's time to eat. They say it's time to go to school. They say it's time to take your bath. It's time to wash your teeth, uh, brush your teeth. Uh, it's time to go to bed. And, and uh, they tell you what to do. And as you get older, you learn character and you replace your parents. Your parents say, don't eat that first, eat this first. Right? I read a thing the other day said, uh, uh, growing up, my parents made me go to bed at 9 o'clock, and I always, I couldn't wait until I got old enough uh, to decide when I I go to bed when I wanted to, and it turns out it's 9 (laughs) o'clock. Character is parenting yourself. Notice this key statement, goals and responsibilities increase character. Now, I I want you to get this, and this is one of the top statements in all the lesson, top three statements. You do not have character to reach or accomplish a goal. You have a goal or responsibility to increase your character. You say, I set a goal, but I don't have the character to complete it. No, you need to set a goal. That's what develops character in your life. Goals develop character. When you don't have goals, it's more difficult to get going. I love this statement. We can do far more than we think or feel like we can do. It's hard to get out of bed early in the morning unless it's deer season. Hard to get out of bed early in the morning unless it's time to go fishing. Unless it's something we want to do. Isn't it amazing what we can do when we want to do that? When we want to do that, we can do far more than we think or feel like we can do. It's an amazing thing what we can do when we set our minds, we set our hearts to doing it. That's what we want to do. Here's a list of traits, character traits, that setting a goal or having responsibility will help you to increase. I've given you eight or nine of these here. Uh, Notice, first of all, number one, courage. Courage. Joshua was given the task of leading the children of Israel after the death of Moses. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 8, he said, be of good courage. And several times he repeats that over and over. And you see the responsibility he had as leader required and promoted this matter of courage. Courage is a decision. Fear is a reaction. Fear is a reaction. I love the statement of Winston Churchill who said, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. And so what he's telling Joshua, and he told Moses, you tell Joshua what I tell him. Let's everybody tell him what he needs Uh, to lead the children of Israel. You're going to have to have courage, be courageous. So when you set a goal, it may be be beyond what your ability is. It may be out of your comfort zone. For example, you decide I'm going to be a soul winner in 2023. Brother Rogers was telling me a while ago about going soul winning and having folks saved. Brother David Perry uh, led a lady to Christ today and he said it was so exciting. He said it's exciting to win people to Christ. It's exciting. Now Brother Rogers felt just, he he was a little bit upset because he he likes to do the talking when they're going to get saved. He's a little bit mad at Brother Perry that he didn't get to talk. But anyway, he's not a very good silent partner, but he's a great soul winner. If you're going to be a soul winner, you have to have courage. Otherwise, you may not have courage. But if you're going to go, you have to say to yourself, I can do this. God can give me the strength. I can do this. You see, setting a goal develops character. It'll give you courage. Let me give you the second thing, commitment. Commitment. They made fun of Nehemiah and his workers in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse number 8. And they asked five questions of them. And they basically said, are they committed? Will they finish this wall? Are they going to do it? When you set a goal, it helps you to have a commitment. I teach folks, I teach pastors around the country about church growth. And I say folks come to church because they have a need. But they stay in church because they become needed 
And I want you to understand that every person in our church, you're a needed member of our church. You can't just miss and say it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters to God. It matters to one another. The Bible says, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, uh, as the manner of some is. And in that verse it says, provoking one another. We encourage one another by being in church. So setting goals helps develop our character trait of commitment. Number three, self-control. Control, self-control, mentally, morally. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, he talks about rejoicing in the Lord. How can he do that? Well, he's not focused on his circumstances. He's focused on his relationship with God, and he's focused on the will of God. If you will, write down Philippians chapter 2 as well. Philippians chapter 2, where Christ is our example, and he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He came from heaven to earth, and he fulfilled the will of the Father. Jesus said, I do always those things that glorify or that please the Father. So, so setting a goal will give you self-control in life. I want you to look again at verse number 25. Verse number 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. Notice these three words, in all things. In all things. So when we set goals, it affects every part of our life in a positive manner. Today, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning, which is typically my time to get up sometime between 3 and 4 o'clock on Wednesday morning. I had a list of responsibilities and things to do, and every, every hour, every 30-minute block was accounted for and responsibilities. And the thing that kept me focused on uh, what I was supposed to do were the goals and responsibilities that I had. Had meetings when I got here working on the church growth conference. Had meetings with our insurance company today on the telephone. Had a television program this evening to record at 5 o'clock. And then church tonight, when you have goals, it helps you. And some folks say, I don't know how you, how you get all those things done. Well, when you set a goal, it's amazing how you become temperate in all things. And it helps you to accomplish goal. Number four is patience. Number four is patience. If you'll set a goal, it'll help you to have patience. Now remember, patience is not waiting for the right circumstances to get the job done. That's not what patience is. The husbandman is the example of patience. Patience is doing right and waiting for the reward. Not delaying the obedience, but obeying and waiting for God to give the reward. And so setting a goal will help us with patience. Number five... Setting a goal helps our faith in God. It increases our faith in God. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. It increases our faith in God when you have a goal. You see, when you have a goal, you start looking at people in the Bible who had similar goals, and you start asking the question, Lord, if you answered that prayer for Nehemiah, would you answer that prayer for me? And when you increase your prayer time, you increase your faith in God. And I'm challenging you tonight and I'm asking you tonight to pray about goals that you need to set in your life in 2023. You, you, it's not a rule that you can only set goals on January 1st. It's not a goal. That is not a responsibility just for January 1st. You need to have goals in your life and seasonal goals are the best goals to set as we go into seasons. I love this. Number six, it helps us in our discernment. Helps us in our discernment. You know, when you don't have goals and you're just in neutral in your body and your mind and spirit, you don't think much. But, but when you have a goal, uh, you have discernment and it affects every part of your life when you have a goal. When you have a goal. What about reading your Bible in the morning or listening to the Word of God? Uh, what about a goal of giving out 10 gospel tracts every week? What about setting a goal in your Sunday school class and helping your teacher to have a record attendance? You see, it will affect every part of your life. It will help your mind in discernment. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1, uh, the Bi Bible talks about trying the spirit. You understand there are many false spirits in our, in our world today. And, and most folks don't think about them. They don't think about them because they're not going anywhere. And it doesn't matter. But when you have a goal in life it helps you with discernment. Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 1. Let's look at that quickly and see what that verse says. And uh, you probably have it memorized but let's look at it.
Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. When you think about the laws of God, when you focus on the Word of God, you have a goal to be spiritual. If you have a goal to be spiritual, you're going to think about those Ten Commandments. You're going to think about what God says to do. Look at verse number 2. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding uh, in the sight of God and man. Understanding, very close to the word discernment. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You see discernment in that? Uh, we're not in neutral. We're paying attention to what everybody says. And we, we, we hear something on the radio and we say, now wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. We hear someone say, but sports betting would add $30 million to our state budget. That's true. It is true. But Kentuckians have to spend $300 million for the state to profit $30 million. And I don't know about you, I'd rather Kentucky people keep the money and let the state live on what they have already. And I hear those statements and I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Because when you have a goal, when you're going somewhere, you're working to be spiritual, you're working to please God, it helps you in this matter of discernment. Number seven, alertness or being sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Uh, your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I love the next one. That's caution. That is caution. That's paying attention. Uh, boy, if you have a goal, you're working to reach a goal, you're cautious, you're cautious about your behavior. You're cautious in your mind. You're cautious in your feet. You're cautious about where you go and what you're doing. Then uh, the last one in this list of character traits, that goals will help you in the matter of diligence, not being a time waster. Not being a time waster, but being diligent. I love working on my, uh, on my daily work goals, and I like to get them finished ahead of time. I like to get them finished. I like to be ready for church three hours before it starts. I like to be ready for church, and I, I, preach, to, I preach every day this week somewhere, uh, sometimes more than once a day, and it's important to be prepared. And when you have goals, it helps you to be diligent and not to be a time waster. Let me tell you one of the most embarrassing things you'll do. We've learned about budgeting. When you budget, you write down every dollar and dime that you spend and how you spent it. Have you ever done that with your time? Have you ever written down how you spend your time? For example, every time you spend 15 to 30 minutes just playing on a phone, you write it down. And every time, every action of how you spend your time, you write it down, you come to the end of the week and you realize, man, I spent 14 hours on my phone. I forget what the hour, hourly average is of a person watching television. It's quite a few hours, eight or ten hours a week. And then you look at that beside prayer. Time in church. Time reading the Bible, and you say, wow, I spent a whole 52 minutes reading the Bible and 28 minutes praying and 10 hours on my phone and 10 hours watching television. But you see, when you set goals, you're more diligent with your time. You pay attention to how your time is spent. Are you still with me tonight? All right, let's talk about temperance. Character is a control of my behavior. It's parenting myself. Then temperance, it also means controlled, but it also is activity that we do. And, and, and it's, it's how we, the word temperance, and I, I've used this illustration about a salt shaker, it's tempered by the lid that's on it and lets a certain amount come out. When I set goals, it helps me with my temperance. It allows the emotions to come out that should come out and holds back what should not come out. So it's a tad different than character. Temperance means controlled. Notice these things that it helps us to control. Temperance means controlled, controls our emotions. You know, what are our emotions? To laugh, to cry, to be sad, to be happy. You'd be su surprised how many commands in the Bible are connected to your emotions, and you'll find out what, what God teaches is that my emotions are given to control, not to control me. 
There are times to be sad. There are times to be sober. There are times to be somber. There are times to be happy. There are times to have fun. Right now is a time to just listen and learn, to be challenged in learning. So we control our emotions. Right now, it doesn't matter how we feel. Had we rather be set back in a, a recliner that's softer than the chair you're sitting in, just relax, uh, maybe drinking a tea or, or drinking a glass of milk or, uh, boy, I don't want to get started there because I thought of a lot of things I'd like to eat right now, milk and bread. And, and anyway, uh, but, but we, we're, we're controlling our emotions. We're not doing what we feel like doing. We're doing what we're supposed to do right now. We're in church. We're learning the Word of God. So it helps us to be temperate in all things. It means control, controlling our emotions, controlling our actions, controlling our responses. Controlling our words. Sometimes we want to say things that we shouldn't say, but if our goals are before us, one goal, and I'll preach on this Sunday night, I am supposed to be becoming more like Christ. That's why he saved me. And I'll preach that message Sunday night. If I want to become more like Christ, there are times that I need to be quiet. And I have to have discernment. I have to have temperance in the control of my words. The control of our minds, our thinking, what we think about, what we do not think about. Controlling our schedule. Then last of all, and I want to finish on time, setting goals increases our strength. You say, I just don't have the energy. I just don't have the energy to reach that goal. Well, you don't get strength before the goal. You get strength from working to reach the goal. So the more we exercise, the more strength we gain. As we work to reach our goals, we push ourselves with character and, and temperance, and we gain strength. We gain strength mentally. Isn't it amazing what we can do when we decide to do it? What we can do mentally. Strength of self-control. Strength of accountability. Strength of teamwork. Strength of hope. Now, what goals do you have in life in 2023? What goals do you have in life in 2023? Before we get to that, let's look at James chapter 1. I want to read this if we have time, and we do. Uh, let's look at uh, James chapter 1. Verse number 2, My brethren, count it all joy... When you fall into divers temptations. Now, the word temptation here, there's two meanings of the word temptation. One is the tempting of our flesh, and the other is a trial of faith. Now, you say, how do you know which one? Well, you read the commentary on the Bible. You say, which commentary you use? My favorite is the next verse or the context. How do I know what this falling into the trying of my divers temptations, how do I know what that is? Uh, what, what that is? Verse number three, three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect or complete. What is perfect? What's a perfect score? It's 100. Don't stop till you get a perfect score. So let patience have her complete or perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire lacking or wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, uh, uh, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So what's he saying here? You set a goal and you let that goal determine your direction. Your goal will increase your character, your goal will increase your temperance, and your goal will increase your strength. 